Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. This is Anthony. And that means this is James, and we're going to do a fun list episode today. Kind of like, we, everyone loved the 100 movies to see before you die list, and then we did the worst movies of all time. So now mm-hmm. we're doing the best crime films ever made, and this list was so hard to make because there are so many great movies, and like, do it's a kind of ambiguous genre. Do we include mob movies? Do we include horror movies? So we decided we'll, we'll include mob movies Keep it minimal horror movies because outside of Supernatural, pretty much every horror movie is a crime movie. So it's kind of like more like the plot is revolved around a crime or a series of crime. Yeah, and you could say crime is the best genre for movies because so many of the best movies ever made are involved in the crime genre. I mean, from The Godfather to like Silence of the Lambs to like horror movies like Seven. And and then you have Heat. So like it can be everything from like cops and robbers to just an investigation to actual criminals as the leads. And so it has a wide scope in terms of what you can tell the story for a crime movie. And I think that's why it it probably is the best genre for movies. Yeah, it's so enticing to watch these stories of these people that like they do terrible things, but also it's like you kind of like want to get inside their brain and understand how they operate. And like it's kind of like living vicariously Curiously through these characters and these people, a lot of them based on real stories, you know. Or, yeah, I mean, or, sorry, serial killers are so big right now. The, They're so serial hot killers right have now. been hot for like thirty years. Yeah. People have been obsessed with them. Like true crime podcasts are number one on the planet. Mm-hmm. Those are the most popular podcasts in the world, like Crime Junkie. People, are, I think, are attracted to like the nefarious nature of humanity, and um, even though most, like the vast majority of people, are like good, decent people, there are those, there are bad people out there, and they, some people are just born bad, and some people become bad, and. They do horrible things, and like that's the world we live in. And I think that because so mo- so many of us don't have exposure to that, we're fascinated by seeing it. And there's just something you- undeniably interesting about watching someone on screen who is just an evil person. But not just evil. I mean, uh, the crime genre, as we'll discuss through the list, some of the people, they're not truly bad, evil people. They're just like kind of taking advantage of the system or... Or, you know, their characters aren't horrible people. You know, it's just yeah. like the way they're born or they take advantage of a situation. Try and get ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's there's a, a there's gray a balance. Area. There's a balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. committing crimes, yeah. but they're not like, oh, I'm going to kill a ton of people today. It's not like yeah, that. It's not bad. like John Doe. Yeah. yeah. You're right. You're right. There's <laughs> but, um, a gray area. This list we have 50. Accumulated list of It 50. was hard to make. We had to make a lot of cuts. I'm sure some people are going to be like upset that Boondock Saints is not on here. It's funny. I, I started the idea. I was like, oh, we can make like talk about like five movies. And then as I was making a, the list, I was like, oh, my God, there's so many. And then you made a list of 100. And I was like, we got to cut that. Yeah, I, cru- I cruised. I made an easy list of 100. <laughs> but there were some on there that did not need to be there. Yeah. But we wanted to like mix up the genres, mix up the kinds of movies we talked about for the crime genres. Because like, because like we said, it's so expansive of a genre. So we think we have a, a pretty solid list. Of just like our favorites and what we think are considered the best of all time. And this is in no particular order. And I personally, I purposely put like a lot of the movies that were in, you'll see some from transferred from the 100 movies to see before you die yeah, for sure. But yeah. I try to put a bunch of ones that we haven't talked about yet in the first like 20 that we talk about. And then at the end of the episode, I think we should reveal what we think is our favorite crime movie Ooh. ever. I didn't, I didn't even prepare that. I'm so well, get ready. I, I'm flustered. You, you should have warned me. Get, the nerves are kicking, man. <laughs> I want to hear your answer. <laughs> but before we get into the list, the best way to support Raiders of Lost podcast is to share us with your friends and family or become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost podcast. Patrons get perks like personalized videos, podcast schedules. Top tier patrons get a monthly shout out on the podca- podcast podcast. Immortalized forever. The best perk of all, though, is you get access to weekly bonus episodes that no one else can watch or listen to, just patrons. And we're actually, we just did our first meet and greet. It was a lot of fun. We had a Zoom call and a bunch of people from who are patrons came and chatted with us. So much fun talking with y'all. Yeah, so head on over to our website, Raiders of Lost Podcast. Also to check out all of our sources of content, our merchandise, our custom movie posters. Follow, subscribe wherever you're listening. Leave comments, like the buttons, and and leaving those five-star reviews are super helpful. Let's get into it. All righty. So why don't you just lead us off, Anthony? Let's start off with Heat. And again, this is in no particular order, but Heat directed by Michael Mann, which came out in 1995. And I think this is probably the most famous cops and robbers movie that exists. Yeah, you brought this up like three episodes in a row. Yeah, I love this movie. (laughs) I recommended it on a streaming recommendation. I really adore this movie because it's... It's an epic. It's like three hours long, and it's like it it just flies by. It never feels long. It's got De Niro and Pacino, obviously two heavyweights, and they share that famous scene together. But also the 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 way it's written and the way Michael Mann directed it, he is a really brilliant director. He's one of my favorite directors in American history, and he he shot it with anamorphic lenses. It's just an a fantastic movie. It's so well done, and you never like I still don't think anyone has been able to top 
the bank robbery scene. The shootout. Yeah, the shootout. That shootout is the best shootout in movie history. Yeah, and the characters are all so great and unique. That's what I think what makes this, this scene, the movie so strong. Is it's just not they're just not going after each other, but De Niro's character has the subplot with his crew and then also his love interest. And then Pacino's character and his, his uh, wife he's being separated from and his stepdaughter. You really know the characters. So yeah, we get to know them so well and that just adds to the story. And they don't make movies like this anymore. Like no one would make a three hour long cops and robbers movie anymore, but Michael Mann got away with it. Not without Thanos in it. And then Val Kilmer is great in it. (laughs) Yeah, without Thanos. Prime prime Val Kilmer. Yeah, I adore this movie. And even just the opening scene when they they, uh, rob the armored truck. It's so fantastic. It's epic. Yeah. And Danny Trejo is in it too. He's yeah. awesome. But speaking of Val Kilmer, I want to watch that documentary. Yeah, you yeah. See trailer? yeah. I didn't know that he it had throat cancer. You didn't know that? Yeah, and that he can't. He has the voice box. Yeah, he um he had the surgery like uh, a few years ago. He hasn't been able to talk without uh, electronic um, device for a long time. Yeah, the documentary, the trailer looks really moving. Yeah. And his son does the voiceover for it. So yeah. it looks incredible. Check it out, guys. Yeah. Um, number two on our list is Catch Me If You Can. This came out in 2002, directed by Steven Spielberg. And this is one of my favorite movies it's such an underrated spielberg movie because obviously his catalog is so immense it's also an underrated leonardo dicaprio movie he plays frank abagnale jr who as a teenager run, runs away from home and starts becoming a con man basically and forging checks impersonating uh, a lawyer a doctor and a pilot and so he kind of just takes advantage of this system that was r- rife to be taken advantage of by a clever person yeah i mean this is before there was electronic computers used by everyone and so everything was done with paper and so he was able to and it's it's a story that's so crazy it's hard to believe that it's real it's like that truth is stranger stranger than fiction kind of deal where you can't believe it that this kid actually did all this and he committed most of these crimes before he turned 20 like he was he was like a teenager during most of this movie yeah and it's dicaprio really i think solidified his acting chops because yeah he was in titanic and then with catch me if you can uh this and gigs in new york came out within two years of each other so he after those two movies it was like He's legit. Well, because he did Titanic, which he was yeah. great in, but everyone's like, then he had the, did the beach, which yeah. was not that great, not a ton yeah, that of critical was acclaim. And people were like, maybe he was like a, just a heartthrob, one-hit wonder kind of guy, but no, he's a superstar. Yeah, exactly. And it, he's going with Tom Hanks as the the protagonist, antagonist, back and forth. And yeah. they're, they're both so good in this movie. This is one of Spielberg's best. It's also, I, I love John Williams' score. It's, it's so it's good. It's very different from what he usually, people usually expect from him. You can't find it on any audio platform. It's only on YouTube. You, you can, can only, find clips of it. Can you buy it, though? I think I, wonder. You, I think you can buy it yeah. it might be buying only you can't get it on spotify apple Podcasts. you can't stream because it's so good it's, yeah. it's it's one of his most unique scores this movie is just has charm drama a great story and um, amazing performance i'm not ashamed it. to admit i've seen it like 15 times oh yeah I don't be ashamed man i've seen it that many times too it's great all right next up we have gone girl which david fincher made in 2014 and uh this was such a surprise of a movie because the book was so popular people were talking about the book i remember and you saw this movie, and once again, David Fincher plays with the the dark nature of humanity. And I, it's not a serial killer in this movie, but it still has like that tendency to e- explore the nefarious qualities that people have. And I, this movie was such a great surprise, such a big twist. Uh, it brought Ben Affleck back from the dead, I think. And Rosamund Pike blew up from this movie. It's absolutely fanta- fantastic. Yeah, Amy Dunn is one of the most interesting characters I've seen in, in decades. She's such a cool character because she's she like gets redemption, but it's like so evil and sinister at the same time. And she's such a complex character because she's so intelligent and she's competing with this fictional character that her parents created her entire life. She never lives up to the expectations of amazing Amy. And then her, her husband, who she thinks is a great guy, ends up like taking everything from her basically and, and almost ruining her life financially and, and emotionally. And then she decides after everything she's been through in her entire life, I'm getting revenge. And then she stages this incredible crime against her husband, which is crazy wild, but it's so clever and fun. Yeah, and Fincher went back to back with Dragon Tattoo and Gone Girl, and it was amazing one-two punch of movies because they're so fantastic. And he's really, like, these two movies, like, this is David Fincher. on Like, he's fully become the filmmaker he always had the potential to be, and he mastered digital cinematography and filmmaking, and... and he always gets the best out of his actors, and it's like when you. This is a movie where like you watch this and like, oh, this is a David Fincher movie, especially because there's Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross doing the score for the second time, and they'll be doing doing his music from now on, and it feels like those guys. They seemed like they're perfect for the style and tone that his movies have. Like yeah. their music is is just pitch perfect for it. Yeah, one of my favorite twists ever because I knew mm-hmm. nothing about it. I went into this movie in the dark, and it became 
one of my favorite Fincher movies. I think it's his top three. And it has a, a similar quality to Fight Club with the narration yeah. as well. So that's it's definitely, so good. You, you get you think about Fight Club when you watch that movie for sure. So good. Number four, we have Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, which was written and directed by Guy Ritchie in 1998. And this is like, you could compare this to like Reservoir Dogs for Tarantino. Like a debut, one of the best English crime films ever made. And this like set the tone for English crime films for a couple of decades there. It changed the way crime films were made there. Like yeah. this became like everyone the style. copied this. The same thing with Reservoir Dogs where everyone tried, everyone copied the intense violence and wildness of it. And the ir- irony. Yeah, whereas this one, British filmmakers were copying like the tone and the humor and portray- how they portrayed criminals. And I-, I love this movie because it's so funny. You love all the characters. And it reminds me, I think the... The closest thing to Guy Ritchie is, are the um, what are they called? They made uh, Good Time, the brothers. Oh um, oh, the, what the, I can't believe I'm yeah. blanking on their name too. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember uh, the life of me. It's, so it's early, upset. guys. It's Holy early crap. in the morning. Yeah, Sorry, it's <laughs> But I think they've they're the closest thing to capturing like the the tone of Guy Ritchie's early movies. Those the thrilling crime films that are a lot of fun and have great characters. Yeah, and this movie's so full of energy. It's such a fun roller coaster ride, and it's. And entertaining as hell. The characters are all so unique. That's what's great about Guy Ritchie's early films and some of his newer films. The characters are incredible. And also is Jason Statham's breakout. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's where this, he, I think this... he found Jason Statham like on the street or something, something like, like, like coming I, out of a coffee shop. I don't know. Yeah, they, that's they, what I heard. I thought they met at a party. This is what I read. Who knows? Who knows yeah. what's right? Yeah. Fact check. I mean, or like from he, source. Trust me, bro. He went from a uh, professional diver to action star. Yeah, he was almost an Olympic diver, yeah. Jason Statham, but he yeah. never made the national team. All right, anyways, let's move on. Next up, we have In Bruges, which I adore. It was made by Martin McDonough. This was his first movie, and um, Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, and Ray Fine star in this film, and it is so different from anything you've ever seen before. The script, I think it's one of the best written scripts of the century. It's so funny. It's so uh, tongue-in-cheek. It's so politically incorrect, and it can- it's offensive at times, but I mean, that's that's the whole point. You know I mean? This guy, he makes fun of everyone in this movie, and I, it's rare to see dialogue this good, and it's his best movie so far. He also did um, uh, Three Billboards, and he also did Seven Psychopaths, but I still feel like In Bruges is McDonough's great, great film. It's the Safty Brothers. Safty Brothers. Safety Brothers. Sorry, guys, for not getting that on the it's spot. It's early. Again, we just woke up, and yeah. we're doing this before it gets too hot in the afternoon. Um, in Bruges was one of those movies that like never heard about it. I like Colin Farrell, but still, like, 2008 Colin Farrell, he's, like, come kind of off Daredevil, and he's not doing a ton of big movies yeah. yet. This is before that run of, like, great indie films and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think he just is so good in this movie. This is the first time I saw Colin Farrell. I'm like, that guy is such a good actor. Yeah. I had no idea. I thought he was just, like, kind of just, like, a, a romantic guy or action guy. He had never done comedy before. But he's so but good. he's great. Brendan Gleeson's Ray Fiennes, they're, they're all phenomenal. Yeah. And it's such a f- ironic, dry humor script. It's like... If Wes Anderson made a rated R movie. <laughs> yeah. Kinda. And the, the amount of cursing in it, I love. It's so funny. It's great. A lot of C-bombs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two, next, we have Inside Man, oh, yeah. which was directed by Spike Lee in 2006. This is one of my favorite heist movies. I think it's so underrated, and I wish people more people talked about it because, obviously, we have Denzel and... Um, Clive. Clive Owen as the two leads going back and forth. But the heist, I'm not going to spoil it in case you guys haven't seen it. It's such a clever setup and pull off of what the heist is of this robbery at this bank. And Denzel plays the lead detective. And also there's some really powerful themes in terms of, uh, you know, Jodie Foster's character. And then um, what's his name's character? Oh, what? I can't remember. We're forgetting name. a lot of names. Yeah, today. it's early. We Christopher Plummer. Yeah, Christopher Plummer's character. And it's so well done. And I love Denzel's character. It's very... he. Um, it's very film noir inspired, especially his character. He's like an old school kind of comp. He wears like you know the the, the top hat. And he's got swag. He, the way he dresses, it feels like he's from like from the fifties and sixties. You know what I mean? And he has that manner. Also, this is um one of Chio Talagio for his big movies, his first movies as well. He plays um his uh, assistant detective as well. Yeah, they did this, then they did American Gangster a couple yeah, years later. Yeah, back to back. He must have recommended him. And this is one of my favorite Spike Lee movies. I think it's fantastic. It's so well made. And it's just, I've seen it a bunch of times, and I still, even the twist, is it's still a lot of fun to see how they pull off the heist. Yeah. It's, it's a perfect plan the in first a lot of time, ways. The first time I saw it, it blew my mind. I'm like, I could do that. I could get away <laughs> with that. How come no one's ever thought of that? But it's so it's so complex, but also so simple at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's a really cool movie if you guys haven't seen it. Yeah, I love it. 
All right, next up we have The Place Beyond the Pines, which uh, was made by Derek Chan France and stars uh, Ryan Gosling. This is their second collaboration after Blue Valentine. And this movie, it just knocked me on my ass. It's so unique. And it's uh, it's it's like Moonlight in a, in a lot of ways. The, the triptych storytelling where he tells each um, act is a completely separate time period that follows the one storyline throughout the, the time events, like 30 years or so. And it, Ryan Gosling completely changed his look and... He's covered in the tattoos. He's got the blonde hair. And you've never seen him like this before because he's always been such a likable guy. But here he plays someone who does bad things. I don't know. A lot of girls liked him in this, too. Yeah, yeah. He's pretty likable in yeah, this. Pretty like, he's pretty <laughs> likable. <laughs> but it's a very unique crime film because it takes – first we think we're following his character. And then suddenly we're, we're following Bradley Cooper's character. And, and then we're following their sons. Yeah, and then their sons. And it's a brilliant way to tell the story of how this one act kind of like – create this umbrella effect of everyone else's lives yeah it's an epic it's a long yeah. epic over several a couple decades really and it's a great st it's great storytelling and you know ryan gosling plays this this bank robber with a dirt bike which again you watch it's like i could do that's actually a really clever way to do it <laughs> get your hands in the air, your hands in the air. <laughs> <laughs> and bradley cooper plays the cop that catches him and it's and then it's not over it's like you think the movie's over but there's still an hour left of it yeah it's not even close to over and then we have the story of their sons and like the yeah. the relationship between their sons and how they meet and how they are are intertwined and, and conflict with each other too. And it's set in the 90s and uh, the, you got the 90s wardrobe in full effect, the windbreakers, oh, great. windbreakers and Levi jeans the whole time. Classic. I love it. And, and then Rose Burns in it, she's great. Uh, Ray Liotta is actually fantastic in this movie what as do you well. I mean, actually, he's always fantastic. Well, I mean, we it's talked about the, in the name of the king. It's because when day. he's cast in the right <laughs> movies, he's yeah. perfect. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's perfect as a corrupt yeah. detective. But yeah, it's got it's really well written, and um, I I really adore this. Film. Yeah, I love how we have we deal with the oh Ben Mendelsohn. Yeah, Ben great. Mendelsohn's awesome. Yeah. This movie we deal with the repercussions of both the father's actions and how they affected their sons. Yeah, exactly. It's involves really great. police corruption. It, it's so well made. It's very dense. It's a yeah. really really good script. It's like a novel. It's a really good script, yeah. Then oh, man, next up. Then we have Mystic River, released in 2003, directed by the great Clint Eastwood. And this is, there's going to be a lot of Boston crime, I think. We got a couple of Boston crime on here, right? Or is this the only one? I think this is the only one. Did we cut? Well, you got The Departed. We, oh, yeah, we got The Departed. We, yeah. I think we cut The Town. Sorry, guys. No, The Town's here. Is it? All right, so we got three. Boston yeah. crime's all over this, baby. You got to have a bunch of cops and robbers. But one. Mystic River, kid, <laughs> which is a river that flows through Medford, Massachusetts. Medford. This is some Somerville, too. Um, it's about... A child abduction story that happens to these young kids in Boston, and then that's a murder. Well, he gets abducted. What are you talking? About? Oh, sorry, my bad. Yeah, my come bad. on, man. My Have bad. you seen the movie? <laughs> There's both. <laughs> Is that my daughter, Sean? <laughs> my daughter. <laughs> so it's a murder and child that's a great abduction. Great, Sean. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> We almost just threw fists, but now we're laughing. <laughs> so there's a murder and a child abduction. So it's dealing with the complex story of both of those happening to the same group of friends. One, the murders of Sean Penn's character's daughter, and the child abduction is to one of his childhood friends when they were young. And this is Clint Eastwood's movie. He directed yeah. it, and it's uh, fantastic. David Lehane is the author, I think. Yeah, yeah. He, he made like that. He yeah. wrote Shutter Island, so a lot of those yeah. Boston uh, yeah, books. A lot of Boston-based movies, and this cast is insane. You got Kevin Bacon, Tim Robbins, uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, Sean Penn, uh, Laura Linney. It's it's oh, um, Amy Rossum, insane cast. Oh, and she plays a daughter. Yeah, she plays a daughter. And is that my daughter? Is that my daughter? <laughs> and the three leads, they grew up together, but there is the child abduction. Tim Robbins was abducted, and it put this wedge in between them. And they haven't, they've all been estranged from each other, but then they're all re reunited from the investigation because Kevin Bacon plays the cop investigating um, the disappearance and then murder of Sean Penn's daughter, and it's. The accents are, are on point. Everyone did a great job. Tim it, Robbins might be a little excessive. Yeah, he's pretty good though. Yeah, 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 but he's great. Yeah, but he plays a weird guy in the movie. Yeah. you know what I mean. And it's a, it's just a really great drama. It's not easy to watch because it's very serious. There's no levity really, in, except for in the the first tw twenty minutes or so when they're building the the storyline. But at, once it gets going, it's just full on drama and trauma, and it's ve it's very emotional. Yeah, because yeah. they start to turn on each other, and I'm sure I don't want to spoil it, but yeah. it's it's very intense in what happens to friendships over time. It's one of my favorite Sean Penn ca characters. It's one of, great. It's one of Eastwood's best movies too. Yeah. He reminds me of like what our dad was probably like. <laughs> Sean Penn? <Yeah. laughs> Is that my daughter? <laughs> Sorry, that's way too many times. <laughs> that's like four. <laughs> and next up we have Bullet, which uh, was cre was directed by Peter Yates in 1968. And this is uh, a, a fantastic uh, classic film. Uh, Steve McQueen was just the 
the man, the coolest guy there was back in the day. He was a, like a magnetic star back then. Like the, the, I think like Gosling is the next Steve McQueen in terms of just he effortlessly portrays like this cool confidence. You know what I mean? Yeah, like Paul Newman. Kind yeah, of. exactly. And it's it's a great uh, cop drama. Yeah, you can if you watch this movie. If you've never seen it, watch it because you can tell that this had such an impact on procedurals, investigations, and and detective work, and and. The, ch- the car chase in this, I don't think it's ever been topped. I don't care how many Fast and Furious movies there are, the car chase in Bullet is still legendary. Bullet and the French Connection, they were just like, no one's ever been able to compare them because they, were sh- it was, they didn't have CGI. You know what I mean? Yeah. They were shooting for real, and like they were really crashing cars. They have some heavy muscle cars. Yeah. You know, yeah. they're they're not that light. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the hills in San Francisco, really cool driving through. And I think that this movie, obviously, not just inspired car chases, but a lot of people copied that the hilly um, chases in San Francisco after this. And not even just the car chases, like yeah. the chases in the hospital. Yeah. Like a lot of it, it just seems like inspired so many filmmakers. Yeah, I bet the Dark Knight was inspired by this. The hospital sequence. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of it was. Maybe. All right, then we have Sicario, released in 2015, directed by Denis Villeneuve. Um, we've talked about this. We did an episode on Sicario, and it's an incredible film. It's obviously an exaggeration of the 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 drug cartel war on the border of Mexico and the United States. So, of course, it's Hollywood eyes. And, you know, all these things don't happen on a daily basis. It's not like a literal war zone down there. They but, cherry-picked a bunch of stories and yeah. put them into one. So I want to make that clear. This is not what it's really like down there. But it is an incredible film. The acting is incredible. Roger Deakins' cinematography, this is one of his best shot films for sure. Emily Blunt's fantastic. We get the great Benicio Del Toro, Josh Brolin. The cast is insane. And the action sequences are so well done because Denis doesn't like to do like handheld. He doesn't like to do fast camera work. He just patiently shoots these sh- these scenes. And also, one of my favorite scenes in the movie, maybe in the last few years, is when they travel across the border into Juarez. Like, it's just... A, a caravan of cars and trucks driving from one place to another place. Nothing happens until they get to the to the border at the end. But that it's the, like five minutes. The suspense that they build with the music as well, Johan Johansson's score is so palpable and so intense. Like it's five minutes where you're like on edge and you're just waiting for something to happen. And then it happens when they're about yeah. to cross the border yeah. in, the, in the traffic gym. So great, great filmmaking, incredible movie. It's 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 a dark watch. So yeah. if you're not into like intense violence and gore you might want to step back but this one's epic yeah next up we got the town kid yeah kid let's go town. let's go directed, i was like of course we had the town on directed here directed by benny affleck let's do this all in a boston accent <laughs> i don't care if it annoys anybody this this was uh ben affleck's second directorial day de- uh not second effort. debut second directorial <laughs> effort directorial effort you're gonna say debut i saw yeah, it i was <laughs> <laughs> you did this after gone baby gone also uh, written by david Lehan, who is just like a, a great boston author and this was like when, because Gone Baby Gone was really good, but then when Affleck came out with this, you're like, holy shit, he's a good director. He did a fantastic job, and also he acted in this as well. Um, it's, wrote it's, the script, too. Yeah, wrote the script. Yeah, kid. Yeah, he did, he did everything, kid. And it's like a freaking heist in Fenway Park. Are you kidding me? It's, it's so awesome. badass. It's, it's, incre- it's so cool. I remember watching the trailer. I was like, what is this? I got to see this. Yeah, it's so cool. They're shooting machine guns in Fenway. This has never happened in Fenway, by the way, guys. Yeah, it's, it's an exaggeration. Not, it's, it's not based on a real story. But it's very cool. But there you know, there are a lot of robberies in Charlestown and in the, in the town and in South Boston for sure. But you know, this movie, it's one of my favorite heist movies. It's so fun. Ben is a triple threat for sure in this movie. And, and he's one of the best triple threats out there. It's it's a perfect uh, robbery movie. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. There's no fat on it. And great cast. It's got Jeremy Renner. Oh, Jeremy's so good. Am- amazing. Is in it this. gem or is it Jim? <laughs> well, the teachers just say this guy's such a gem. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the, uh, they all got the tight Boston fade. <laughs> and and Ben did a good job. He had the other two guys in the crew. They're really from Boston. So it like, gives the authenticity to the characters in the, in the posse yeah, and the crew. Yeah, it really worked. And then Rebecca Hall is great in this as well. It's, it's a fantastic crime movie. I love it. Oh, Blake Lively too. Yeah, yeah. really good cast. Yeah. Next up, we got The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, released in 2011, 2011, made by David Fincher. And this is, unfortunately, the only version that Fincher got to make. I wish he got to make more of the Elizabeth Salander original trilogy. And He said said it was actually his dream to make uh, a franchise of hard R movies. But it only made like $220 so it probably just made its money back and then enough for the marketing and they— 
studio didn't want to take another shot on it, which is too bad because this movie is fa- it's so good. It's so well made. Rooney Mara is perfect as Elizabeth Salander. And we've seen the Swedish versions. They're also very good, too. And that's Numi Rapace, who is the original Elizabeth Salander. But Elizabeth Salander is a fascinating character. We love the books, two big fans of the of the books by Stig Larsson. And I think Fincher just not that the other ones aren't great movies, but he just takes it to another, another level because he's David Fincher. Yeah, and Daniel Craig is sensational in this because he carries the screen, and it's always good to see him not as Bond because you get to see how talented he is. And But the thing, like, you're right. The difference is because the Swedish films are really well made. The director did a fantastic job, but Fincher is just on another level in terms of his visual storytelling and how smart he is with what he's doing. And just the way he directs movies are is second to none. And the quality and difference of storytelling, like there's a bit, there's a major difference. And here's an example, like so when um, Christopher Plummer he reveals the the rose, the flowers to the on the wall. Yeah, but don't spoil it. Oh, I'm not spoiling. Yeah, it. yeah no, I'm sure. But so in the in the Swedish version, um, they set up the scene, and then the director shows that first, and then he shows the two characters talking about what it was. Whereas Fincher. Because he understands how to build suspense, he has the characters enter the room and they talk about what they're looking at and they're looking at something, but we don't know what they're talking about. But Daniel Craig is acting like very disturbed in, in like what's going on. And then Fincher reveals what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. So it's the way that he directs where he visually builds suspense on top of what the characters are saying and what the script is saying. Yeah, another great example real quick of it is when Elizabeth Slender is first introduced in the Swedish version. It's just like a yeah. shot of her face, just like on the elevator thing coming up. But in the Fincher version, when she's coming up the elevator and walking through the halls of the office, he doesn't show Elizabeth's face at all, but he just shows everybody reacting to her. because he shows the back of her. Yeah, because Elizabeth yeah. Slender has a very unique hairstyle. She's got a bunch of facial tattoos, and the way she dresses is very intense and gothic and like dark and edgy, so like Everyone in like punk rocker, so everyone reacts to her in in a weird way because they don't look. She doesn't look like them. Yeah, and so that's how he starts to reveal her, which builds up the anticipation of who's who is she, what does she look like. And the first shot you see of her is her driving her motorcycle with her helmet from the window. So he he just builds the suspense of her reveal. Different different t- different level of director. Yeah, not exactly. that they didn't do a great job. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have the Nice Guys, which was made by Shane Black. I love this movie. It stars Russell Crowe and Ryan Gosling, and this is set in the seventies, and it's just a fun uh, detective drama where you have a couple of private eyes who are investigating uh, a murder, a, a missing girl, and it's so much fun. Gosling and Crowe together is just so magnetic, and the energy they have, they play, play off each other so well. The comedy is on point, and I just really, this is, movie is just a flat out good time. It's so underrated. Yeah. I wish more people saw this movie. I wish it made a bo- huge box office. It would have been awesome. I'm sure they wanted to do a sequel yeah. because it would have been so fun. The character, like Gosling and Russell Crowe together, it's some of my favorite chemistry I've seen in like a buddy cop film. I think this is the only buddy cop movie in the list. But it's, I think it might be my favorite buddy cop movie in general besides, well, maybe Rush Hour. I don't know. It's tough to choose. But, I mean, The Nice Guys, it's so fun. It's so well made. It's just a really good time. Yeah, It's, I, it's hysterical. I love, it. I love it. It's so good. Then we have Ooh. Memento, released in 2000, directed by Christopher Nolan. This was a knockout of a screenplay. I think he won an Oscar. Nominated. Got nominated for Oscar. Should have won, but it, it, he hasn't won shit. It's crazy Chris no one hasn't won anything. He hasn't won an Oscar. <laughs> but it's about a man who has short-term memory loss and he's trying to track down his wife's murder. And Shelby Leonard is a very cool character. He's very interesting, played by Guy Pierce. And what the genius of the storytelling is, there's a, a storyline going forwards in time and then there's a storyline going backwards in time. And... Nolan just plays this is like early concept of him playing with time and that's what makes it so fascinating to to follow and makes it a little confusing but when you pay attention if you watch it on a second viewing it just you get so much more out of it every time a lot of great imagery too like the scene opens up with him in reverse of him shaking the Polaroid picture and then the bullet going into the gun so it's basically an inverted bullet yeah, it's an inverted. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even know he was inverting things and then he came up with the idea of it um, but it shows like you said is 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 a adoration for playing with time with his movies and i know people think that he uses too much exposition he doesn't really if you look at it and he actually helps the audience especially with this film by determining what's what by using black and white for one storyline and color for the other storyline black and white is forward yeah and so and also he's that's the character who's narrating everything as well so you it helps he it's hard to see your first watch, it can be confusing, but on repeat viewings, it gets better. And it's got a fantastic twist. One of my favorite twists at the end. 
Amazing. Yeah. And the opening shot, too, that perfectly encapsulates uh, the, the Leonard's idea. mind. Yeah. He's telling you what this is about yeah. right away. And um, before we continue, let's take a moment to talk about crime. Speaking of it, it would be a total crime to neglect yourself. A manscapes lawnmower. And the way the storyline and characters are laid out, it feels like it's from like the 50s and 40s, like those all newer gangster movies types. And it's, he did a fantastic job. He showed his talent as a director. This was made on a shoestring budget. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he was he was a pretty well-known actor by then. He had done the TV show and he had done, he had done a few movies. It was 10 Things I Hate About You yeah. before this too. Yeah. Yeah. And so he was pretty established as, a, as an actor. And he uh, loved the script so much that he did it for like ne next to nothing for money. And this is where they started their uh, relationship working together. They've been in, he's worked in every single one of Ryan Johnson's films, like except for, oh no, he's probably in Star Wars, I'm sure, like as like a. He a plays voice. the guy, they're at that gambling casino place, and he's talking to the authorities saying, oh, I saw them, they're over there. Okay, and they so went that way. So in that, his, his voice is in Knives Out when. Uh, and Armis' sister is listening to that murder investigation. That's jo that's Joseph Gordon Levitt's voice on the on the, the narration, computer yeah. on the laptop. And this movie, it's it's really cool because Ryan Johnson's kind of playing with like different styles of filmmaking that we hadn't really seen before, especially in like an indie film. And it's a great mystery of of, jo of Joseph Gordon Levitt's character just trying to figure out what happened to his ex girlfriend. Yeah, if you guys haven't seen it, check it out. It's really great. Next up, we have the Fugitive. Wow, you're just stealing my my thunder here. Oh, sorry. I'm next, man. Sorry. Go ahead. The Fugitive. I got excited. I love this movie. <laughs> Released in 1999, directed by Andrew Davis, Dr. Richard Gamble. Kimball. I'm sorry, Kimball. Um, it's it's Detective Harrison, Kimball. <laughs> Harrison Ford is such a great actor, and I think with movies like this and Air Force One, he showed you like, yeah, I'm Indiana Jones, I'm Han Solo, but I can also be a great actor in, in a huge franchise movie somewhere else as well. In the Fugitive, yeah, I mean, he's Jack Ryan. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Harrison Ford. He's probably the best actor of all time in terms of like. A legend. He's he's the man, and he's so fun in this movie. In the Fugitive, it's you know the wrongfully accused investigation, and it's it's been done so many times since it was made, and everyone's tried to copy it because it's so good. You forgot to mention one important thing: Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, Tommy. Yeah, yeah. yeah Tommy Lee Jones. I was waiting. I was waiting for you to pick that he up. He got nominated for this for an That's Oscar. Right, yeah. He's so good in this. He was so good that they made a sequel to this with just Tommy Lee Jones' character called U.S. Marshals because he his character is so awesome. And everyone loved him. I this is one of my favorite like uh, chase movies. Like it's got like like the Bourne movies follow the same procedural of someone who is being on the run from the law, but he's really a good guy. You know what I mean? And it, it's something that's been done so many times. But this is so fantastic. And the sequel is good too. It has Wesley Snipes as the guy on the run. But just Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford together is so fucking awesome. I yeah. love it. it. There's some points where it's like a little ridiculous, like the train crash, and he's like the only one who survives and yeah, stuff like that. Still, but you know whatever. what? Harrison Ford, of course he's going to survive a train crash. He really does in real life surprise <laughs> survive those things, so it's like believable. Yeah, you're, there, He sense. probably was on the train when they crashed it. <laughs> like, it'll be fine. I'll be okay. So I didn't know it was supposed to crash. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Collateral, another Michael Mann film. Very, very underrated movie. This stars Tom Cruise and Jamie, Jamie Foxx and... This is such a great, great film. Uh, Tom Cruise is an assassin who um, embarks on this journey of he has to kill several people who are testifying in an important court case against a big criminal. And then he hires Jamie Foxx as a cab driver to drive him around for the night. And it's such a great character piece between these two opposites. And I, I adore this movie. It's Tom Cruise is at his best. I love him as a villain. He's so fantastic as the bad guy. Yeah, it's cool. His look is just awesome, too. He's got, like, the gray hair, the gray suit, and he's such a badass. And, like, yeah. he, his skill with the gun in this movie is insane. So, like, we haven't really seen an assassin, like, this level, I think, in a, in a film in a while. It was, like, before John Wick, like, seeing someone who accurately handles themselves with firearms. Close quarter hand-to-hand yeah. -hand combat as yeah. well as his uh, handgun firearms. Yeah, exactly. Like, the way he just, like, when he's on the floor and he fires, it's, like, he's perfectly set. And also, everything he every time he shoots someone, it's always chest shot, head shot. Heavily choreographed, yeah. expert marksmanship. Yeah. And the action is fantastic, and it'll blow your mind. And then he's he's on this ride with Jamie Foxx character, who's just trying to make a living. He's trying to set up his limousine company, and he's he's having that like the the, the flirtation and, and interactions with the young woman in the back seat too. With Jada Pinkett Smith yeah. plays the mm -hmm. the woman that he's talking to, and so it's a great back and forth between these two, like you said, polar opposite characters. Yeah, I love that movie. Next up, we have. Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. And we actually talked about this on our bonus episode of Philip Seymour Hoffman Spotlight. And this was released in 2007. Only on Patreon. Yeah, Patreons only. Uh, directed by Sidney Lumet. This is his last film. And this is such a good movie. It's so underrated. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but you got to get on it. Put on your watch list ASAP because it'll blow your mind. It's about these two brothers 
who are desperate for cash despite them sh- not having to be. So they make mistakes in their life, causing them to need money. So they set up a heist of their parents' jewelry store, which they think it's no big deal. It's insured. They'll get the money back. Nothing will happen. We'll just steal all the cash, take some diamonds, and we'll be good to go. But what happens is their mother pulls a gun, and then the guy they hire shoots him, and they shoot each other. And so their mother gets killed during the heist. Yeah, it's a fantastic drama. Philip Seymour Hoffman and Ethan Hawke are sensational. Them two together, so much chemistry. And Marissa Tomei is in it. She's fantastic. This movie... You said fantastic, I think, 15 times today. Uh, these are fantastic movies. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this movie is uh, so awesome, so surprising and shocking. And even though that, that seems like it's the twist, the, the robbery gone wrong, that's not the, the craziest part is the, the last moment of this the last moments of this movie, mm-hmm. which is so surprising. Yeah, and Philip Seymour Hoffman's acting in this is... It's phenomenal. It's one of his best roles. And there's this scene where he's in the car arguing with his wife after after the wake and funeral of his mother. And some of the best acting I've seen in general, let alone just from the great Philip Seymour Hoffman. So if you have not seen Before the Devil, Devil Knows You're Dead, you got to watch it ASAP. Oh, yeah. Next up, we have Zodiac, yes. which I actually just watched the other day. I just, just casually it watched a three-hour yeah. Yeah. serial killer movie. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, no big deal. But, yeah. <laughs> this is, I think, one of the most underrated movies recently. I think it's one of Fincher's most underrated movies because it's so well crafted. And this was, I believe, this was his first digital film. Um, it, it was. Yeah, okay. So, um, his this is where he was like embracing, like, I have complete control over the imagery, and I know what it's going to look like on set, so I don't have to worry about the dailies on film because he was never very satisfied with it. Ton before. of green screen in this yeah. movie. This film is so well acted. You got Jake Gyllenhaal, Robert Downey Jr., um, Mark Ruffalo, ton of great actors. But what I really love about this movie is there's no ch- car chases, there's no foot chases, there's no shootouts. It's just all investigation. And that's what a lot of, co- well, that's what policing is, especially in detective work. Like it's small, it's paperwork. It's talking to other people on the phone. It's invest- filing cabinets. Yeah, filing cabinets, investigating leads. It's a lot of boring work. That And so this movie's so accurate. And also, the Zodiac was just such a crazy story. Yeah, and we have the impact of it over years of investigation on the detective played by Mark Ruffalo and his partner and how one of them just gives up and then they can't catch the guy. And then Jake Gyllenhaal's character becomes so obsessed that he goes in the opposite direction and all, he can't help but investigate the Zodiac missing and he's the guy who wrote it's based on true story he's the guy who wrote the book the Zodiac or I think it's called Zodiac and so this movie it's incredible I'm sure everyone's seen it but I mean even though it's almost three hours long I'm I still watch it regularly and Robert Downey Jr. this is one of his big roles right before Iron Man yeah this yeah this was um when people saw this I think they were like okay he, this guy's back for sure because he did he did kiss kiss bang bang yeah and then I think he did he, two other movies. And then he did something small else. Small roles. But this was like, holy crap. Everyone forgot how good of an actor Robert Downey Jr. was, and he probably should have won an Oscar for Chaplin. Yeah. <laughs> You're still not over I'm that. I'm still not over it, no. That movie's so he's so good in that yeah, movie. He's great. I can't remember I can't remember who he lost to, but I'm like, come on. He's so good <laughs> in Chaplin. <laughs> and uh next up we have Rear Window, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, 1954. We are a wheelchair bound photographer. Spies on his neighbors from his apartment window and becomes convinced that one of them has committed murder. And this is Alfred Hitchcock at his best. Yeah, and this movie is just, it's set in one place. But Hitchcock was such a great storyteller visually that he manages to like make you feel like so much energy in terms of the camera work. Um, the cinematography is fantastic, but it never feels slow. Even though you're just with Jimmy Stewart in this apartment the whole time, literally the whole time, you're in this room with him. But it feels like a really big movie. And I think that it's so well directed and the suspense is so well crafted by the end of the third act You're in the big moments happening. You're like, oh, man, this is crazy. All led up to this. Master of suspense. Yeah. Master of suspense. I-, I adore this movie. It's so good. All right. Next up, we got Widows, which was directed by Steve McQueen, uh, not the actor. <laughs> <laughs> and this is about uh, four women whose husbands and partners were um, bank robbers and they were all killed during a heist. And the mob boss who they stole from wants the money that was wants the money back. And so the wives and enlist- does he want the money or does he want the money that was owed to him? They were supposed well, to- the money was destroyed. Oh yeah, in the in explosion. The, in the explosion. Right, right. So he wants his right. money back. And so the 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 four wives who are now widows they band together and they figure out how to help pull off a heist on their own. Yeah, it's 
there are very few like female led crime movies that like when you look it up so it's it's hard to find them but this one got kind of flips the genre on its head we have four women who are leading this action thriller being total badasses planning a heist and pulling it off and this movie has a wild twist ending but also has some of the best shootouts you'll, you'll see in the recent years especially like when they're when they're in the opening when the yeah, the, the husbands are in the truck getting chased by the police and everything it's incredible what steve mcqueen did yeah unfortunately this movie made no money nobody saw it we so saw good. it in theaters so good and it too. blew us away hans zimmer's score is amazing yeah, too it's great and uh, viola davis is fantastic as as the lead she's the leader of the gang and uh, it's such great acting especially from her colin farrell's great in this as well i mean i uh, i love this movie it was so well made and Steve McQueen, watching him do action, like I wish I want him to do a lot more action yeah. now. I hope he does. Because this is the movie he did after Twelve Years a Slave, right? Yeah. So he took some time and then made he this. Was, this was a TV show in Britain. It was a miniseries, and he was a big fan of it, so that's why he made it. he adapted it himself. So good. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Prisoners, released in 2013, directed by Denis Villeneuve, and we've all seen Prisoners. We did an episode of this comparing it to Gone Girl, and it was. I think one of my favorite episodes we've done because Prisoners is such a fantastic movie. It's about the disappearance of a young girl in this small town. And Jake Gyllenhaal plays the lead investigator. Uh, Detective he, Loki. Detective Loki. He's got great hair in this movie. <laughs> cool haircut. I think he, he probably started that like F-boy, like, like the undercut with the long hair on yeah. top. I'm sure he started it with this. And um, I think David Beckham started it. Maybe. He does start a lot of trends. You're right. Yeah. He's very in vogue usually. And then uh, Hugh Jackman plays the father of the missing girl, and it's it's a great, great story. Incredible cinematography again from Roger Deakins. Like the more you analyze the cinematography, every shot is a work of art. Really, um, Denis Villeneuve is a, a great director. I can't wait to see Dune. Obviously, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. You fantastic. mentioned Dune in every episode. I love Dune. I can't <laughs> wait, man. I can't. I can't wait any longer. I just want it. <laughs> but um, yeah, this was their first collaboration, director and cinematographer, and then um. You could see how in tune they are with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think Villeneuve, his movies are always well crafted, but there's, you could, with this movie, you see what Roger Deakins brings to a story in terms of his genius of cinematography, because this is one of the best shot movies recently. And that's why Villeneuve is like, whenever he can, is like, can I get Roger on this movie? <laughs> <laughs> He's doing Dune, right? No. Who's doing Dune? Uh, I can't remember who. Someone oh, else. That's too bad. So, I and mean, he also did not do Arrival, but um, that looked good as well. But, when there's the difference between prisoners and Sicario and Arrival. Well, Bradford Young did an incredible yeah, job. Yeah, he's, he's on a great cinematographer. Yeah. And he did a great job for in sure. Arrival. But this movie is so excellent. I've seen it in a bunch. Uh, Melissa Leo's great. Paul Dano's great in it. A fantastic cast. Viola again, back to back Viola movies. So, uh, oh, um, Terrence Howard's fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing, amazing movie. Yeah, it's super really, intense. Yeah, you don't really know what's happening. It's what's happened yeah. until the end. It's a very dark movie, and also you've never seen anything like. Uh, Jill and Hall's uh, detective. Yeah. I've never seen a detective like that before. And again, another great twist. Yeah. Next up, we have True Romance, directed by the great late Tony Scott. Um, and this was Tarantino's first script that was ever made into a movie. He sold it to um, the studio because Tony Scott loved it so much. And then he used this money to help keep himself afloat while he got Reservoir Dogs made. So if it wasn't for True Romance being sold, he may not have ever made Reservoir Dogs. So. Yeah. He needed this to get sold. This is a great movie. I mean, Christian Slater, whatever happened to that guy, he was on top of the world at this point. Patricia Arquette plays the girlfriend, the the prostitute that he marries when he's in Detroit. And then he gets in this crazy scheme where he gets this cocaine. He tries to sell it in Hollywood and lots of crime and lots of drama. And it's it's very intense and it's super fun and, and fun at times. And Christopher Walken has a couple of great moments. And there's some great scenes, some really great dialogue. And it's, it's an awesome movie. And I feel like Christian Slater's character is the closest thing to Tarantino himself. Because Tarantino... I can see that. Loves to watch... He used to watch old samurai movies and movie theaters by himself. He was obsessed with Elvis. And uh, so he has so many of the qualities that Tarantino has himself. You like a I mean? young Tarantino. Yeah, exactly. So I think he, like, this is him, the closest thing to him that we've seen. Next up, we have, oh, you're going to say it. Yeah, it's my turn. Your man. turn. American Gangster, directed by Ridley Scott, released in 2007. And this is another epic. We have Denzel Washington playing this this lead drug lord from Harlem, Frank Lucas. And again, True Tao is his right-hand man. Then we have Russell Crowe is investigating him. And the cool thing about it is their characters never interact or meet until the third act of the film. So it's like it's like a three hour movie and they're just both on their own storylines where the detective played by Russell Crowe is just constantly trying to get at Frank Lucas, but he can't yet. I think I, this movie's so underrated. It is. It's so good. And I think the reason why it kind of flies under the radar is because 
It came out in a time where drug movies were very big. There were a ton of movies about drug dealers yeah, and like stuff. Yeah, like Blow and... Yeah, so many of those movies were coming out around the, the 2000s. So I think it, it kind of got lost in the shuffle of all that. But I think looking back on it, it's the best one in it. It really is one of really Scott's best movies. He's He did such a good job with this movie. And Denzel and Russell Crowe are awesome. I, I really love the story. Now, they actually made this into a series with um, Forrest Whitaker is starring in it right now. It's called, I think, The Godfather of Harlem. Yeah. I think is what it's called. It's what, it's what it's called. But this movie is so excellent. I adore it so much. Next up, we have Fargo, directed by the Coen brothers. This is probably their most famous movie and I think it's a a perfect blend of their unique style of filmmaking where you have great storytelling uh, dramatic moments fantastic characters mixed with this very unique style of humor that they have that only they can pull off yeah and they pull off a movie full of Minnesotans talking don't you know don't you know in this crazy ridiculous accent which is fun we love accents yeah. not saying that you guys have a we have a worse accent. We're from Boston. We have the most. We we've come from a city full of people who pronounce words wrong on purpose. All right, <laughs> um, but the Minnesota accent is so fun. But you wouldn't think that like the leads of a movie could have the accent and pull it off into a great movie. You think it'd be too distracting, but I mean, they do a great job. Every single person. Yeah, and Marge is such a fun character because it's like this is the lead investigator. She's like about yeah. to pop pregnant. She's so nice and sweet, and it's not. It's the thing is, is you've never seen a cop like that before. Same thing with Jill Hall. It's like you've never expected to see someone investigating a murder. Or a disappearance is like this very sweet pregnant woman compared to the scum of villains that she's yeah. after. Yeah, exactly. Like so Buscemi's so good in this movie. Yeah, everyone's He's awesome. awesome. This yeah. is a great William movie. William H Macy is We've all sensational. Seen it. And it's been made into the TV show for FX, which I haven't tuned into yet. But I I want to see it because it's an anthology series, so yeah. it's different every season. And it all links to North Dakota or South Dakota or everything. Minnesota. About- no, I know. I know the movie takes place oh. in Minnesota, but I think that all leads to like the show is set oh, in North oh, Dakota. I don't I know. Yeah, I have to look into it. Anyways, let's move on to The Usual Suspects, released in 1995, directed by Brian Singer. One of the best twist-ending movies of all time. Um, this is a great ensemble cast of these, you know, typical usual suspects for a crime that these investigators are trying to solve. And it's it's a great whodunit movie, a lot of great action, a lot of great, really great screenplay. It's phenomenal writing, and the characters are sensational as well. The twist was actually added last minute. Was it really? Yeah, the producers didn't want it, and Singer actually for it was like he was like, "We need to have the twist at the end." Kaiser Soze. Kaiser Soze. It, it's it's great, great movie. When they did the twist that they copied for uh, Scary Movie, it's so fun. <laughs> 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 Officer Doofy, report for, for duty. duty. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Benicio is awesome in this. I love him. Uh, Kevin Spacey. This was his actually his breakout movie. This mm-hmm. was his big one for him. Uh, he, he was nominated for an Oscar, I believe, for this film. And then Brian Singer. This was his second movie after he made, um, what's it called? It's, it's a, a Nazi movie with um, Ian McKillen. Uh, oh, I can't remember. I can't remember. After Pupil. After Pupil. And then then he did X-Men after this. So it was a, great, a great couple of movies by him, although he's, he had become, he's become a very nefarious person in real life and hopefully doesn't get to be in control of people ever again. But um, this is a, a great movie. Yeah, a couple of creeps made that movie. Yeah, a couple of creeps. <laughs> All right, next up we have Knives Out, which came out recently. It's probably was this the most recent one we have on the list. It uh, might be. By uh, Ryan Johnson. We just again. did an episode on it. Yeah. And sensational movie. Daniel Craig's awesome. Anna de Armas, amazing in this movie. Her big breakout. Such a, a well-written movie. The twists in this movie you learn right away. And it not, and Ryan Johnson told the murder mystery in a completely unique way. Yeah, new, great characters, great production design. The cinematography is, is beautiful in this movie. Can't wait for the sequel. It's filming right now in Greece. And, oh yeah! Oh man, it's it's gonna be epic, and the the cast is absurd. They got that Netflix money. Yeah. So if if you guys want more about this, go go watch our full episode on it. We just did it last month. Oh yeah. Next up, we have actually next up. Let's do our intermission. Oh, intermission. Wow. Let's we're, go. Yeah, we're at number we're twenty-eight. We're, I'm having a good time. I forgot. Yeah, we're about fifty it. minutes in. Holy yeah. crap! All right, let's do our our intermission. We're gonna start with our movie quote competition. So this one's for me. No, Tommy. I'm not saying you can't shoot. I know you can't shoot. I'm saying that six-pound piece of shit stuck in your trousers would do more damage if you fed it to him. Hmm. Can you say it again? <laughs> All right, let me try the accent better. No, Tommy. I'm not saying you can't shoot. I know you can't shoot. I'm not that... I'm saying that six-pound piece of shit stuck in your trousers would do more damage if you fed it to him. 
I don't know. Snatch. Oh, he's yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. You're Jason Statham's Statham. character. Yeah. That's not a horrible Jason Statham. I never it tried it. It just wasn't a British accent. I, That's what threw me off. I tried. I, you, was, got, you got his tone right. There's, yeah. there's a hint of a British accent in there. Jeez, yeah, man. It was a cute hint. It was a nice <laughs> one. <laughs> man, destroying my acting career like that. <laughs> you did a British accent? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't even tell. All right, here's mine. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we had a slight weapons malfunction, but uh, everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. That's Han Solo. Yeah. That's uh... <laughs> <laughs> in a new hope. Yeah, yeah. A new hope. You're that's dude. That's a great talk, quote. Yeah, we talked on the radio. <laughs> he improvised that. Yeah. So uh, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Hold on, let me pull a movie quote from a fan. Let's see who we got. Let's hear it. All right. How about from Carmen St. Clair? Cool name. Carmen St. Clair. I figure life's a gift. I don't mind. I don't. Uh, sorry. I'm Great butchering job. it already. Wow. That's why I'm not an actor. And you want to be an actor. <laughs> I never said I wanted to be an actor. I just said I thought I could His do His biggest it. dream is being a, the next James Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Time and wise <laughs> over here. I am. I mean, James D. kid. Anyways. I figure life's a gift, and I don't intend on wasting it. You don't know what hand you're going to get dealt with next. You learn to take life as it comes at you to make each day count. I'm going to do a guess, but I think I'm wrong. I'm going to do... Is it Shawshank Redemption? Nah. What? It's Jack on uh, Titanic. Oh, that's right. That's a good quote. Good quote. All right. Guess this movie release year. You go first. Empire Strikes Back. Empire Strikes Back. That is 1976. 1980. Oh, 1980. Damn. Yeah. I always. The first one was 78. In my head, I always think that the India that the Star Wars movies are were made in like the early 70s. But yeah. even though like the, 78 was the first. It one. just feels like they were made so much earlier. Yeah. I, I don't know why. Because you're crazy. I'm not crazy, man. You're crazy. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. All right, Joker. What do you got? All right. What year did the original Sherlock Holmes come out in? Guy Ritchie. Guy Ritchie one? Yeah. 2009. Yeah. Nice, dude. Yes. Good job. Thanks. All right. Movie pop quiz time. In The Matrix, the first time we see Neo, he is asleep at his computer in his apartment. What is the first thing his computer says to him with text? Wake up, Neo. Yeah, yeah. my guy. Yes. Let's go. I've seen that movie way too many times. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on like 40 watches of that. <laughs> all right. I, I did all for Star Wars. So here's the quiz question. Who is the actor that played Landel Calrissian in the original trilogy? Oh, what's his name? I, I can't remember his name. Billy D. Williams. Yeah. Sounds like a southern guitarist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stevie Ray Vaughan like featuring a, Billy D. Williams. Like a blues guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You want to do Biggest Hater of the Week now? I would love to. All right. This is on TikTok. I posted a clip where we, you made a clip where we're talking about how Harry's more afraid of Cho Chang and dealing with the puberty and adolescence of, uh, of Goblet of Fire. And oh, girl, I didn't even yeah, see this. Girls yeah. and dancing. And so... Just the John wrote, this is stupid. We want movie facts, not puberty facts. Nerd. <laughs> And then I was like, this is a movie fact. Adolescence and puberty, interacting with your crush is a major theme of Goblet of Fire. Have you seen the movie? Then I felt bad because he's like, hey, man, I didn't want you to come at me. I, I was trying to get a biggest hater of the week. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, pal. What's his name? Just the John. Just the John. John. That was, yeah, you offended James. Good job. <laughs> you didn't offend me. But now I feel bad because I was like, actually, you <laughs> Next time, if anyone wants to be top hater, but for fun, do a winky face at the end yeah, of your text. Yeah, put a wink so we know. Because we get so much hate, it's like hard to decipher. That sounds really like it. a hate comment. Yeah. It sounds very dry, like, you total nerd. But it worked. It worked. Yeah. You got me, you man. You got him. All right, I have, uh, I have one from YouTube. Oh, YouTube. Yeah. There you go. Uh, this is uh, Rocky Troop. He commented on the Goblet of Fire episode. Can't believe he didn't remember the car from the clip that he made. Unsubscribe. <laughs> 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 we 
We know you're still subscribed, Rocky. <laughs> How the unsubscribe shirts coming out soon? Oh yeah, we I made the merch design the other day. Oh, you gotta order yeah, it in. Gotta... Put it on the camera for us. Oh, definitely. I'll so do those, that those are gonna we're gonna do a limited release for unsubscribed. Unsubscribed. Anthony's... Our favorite way to make fun of trolls. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have biggest supporters of the week, and I have a few here. We have some really great uh, five star reviews that I'd like to read. Let's hear. This one's from Holes Bodhi. The amount of work these guys put into every episode is insane. I've listened to a few other movie podcasts, and they all have a passion for movies, but sometimes it seems people want to just press record and talk about movies, but these guys seem to do their homework and really come into every episode with a lot of knowledge, but present it in a fun and casual way. Thanks, Thanks for so noticing. Much, pal. Thanks for um, noticing. Then we have S. Steven 0 a truly phenomenal podcast that supplies limitless amounts of entertainment. They make film fun while keeping the audience captivated for an hour and a half. Uh-huh. 10 out of 10. Would recommend. Thanks so much. And then McKenna34, I love, capitalized, love <laughs> your love. podcast. There's no better film podcast out there. I'm an aspiring director, so this helps so much. This is the film podcast everyone needs. Keep up the super awesome and amazing work. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks we, so much for the we kind do words, it for everybody. all you, so we appreciate that you're getting something out of it, especially like yeah. inspiration. Yeah, so yeah. all you students out there, aspiring filmmakers and directors, we love to hear that. So we're happy that we're helping you see film from a different view and appreciate it more. 100%. On this day in film history, July 19th, Mad Men appeared in, t- appeared in 2007, premiered in 2007. You're right there. Yeah. <laughs> Pre- 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 did I said appeared? A- pre- did I say a- appeared? <laughs> <laughs> Captain America First Avenger premiered in 2011 and Train Spotting premiered in 1996. Oh, nice. Very cool. What's your streaming recommendation? Um, Amazon just added uh, a few Hitchcock movies, uh, and so I recommend uh, Vertigo. Which is one of my favorite. I got the poster right here. It's one of my favorite movies. It's my favorite Hitchcock movie. It's a, a fantastic mystery film. Uh, James Stewart's best performance, and it's so mu- so well directed, so well crafted, and uh, I think it's could be the highlight of Hitchcock's career in a movie in a filmography filled with insane movies. Thank you so much for that, Rec. You're welcome. He's and I know a lot of people haven't seen older movies, so check that out. He's pretty good. Yeah, he's, he's, pretty, a, he's a pretty good director. All right, let's get back into our episode of crime movies and we're on number 28 now and this is going to be dog day afternoon released in 1975 directed by Sidney lumet this is uh the second film of his on the list so far and this stars we almost put serpico on it yeah almost almost. but uh so this one stars al pacino and john cazell who again all five of his movies that he was acting were nominated for best picture and this is about uh, an amateur bank robbery and everything goes wrong and this movie opens up so well because it seems like very light and like it's gonna be an easy heist they're gonna get away with it and like it seems simple the setup and how they go into the bank they're very calm cool collected but then everything just goes haywire and, and everything goes wrong but what's so cool is the way he reveals it because the the robbery's happening and it's like oh like you said it seems like it's going well and then they get a phone call and Pacino's like who's what and then he answers it and it's the one of the he's like a sergeant of police force saying what's up asshole look outside and there's like a hundred cops outside <laughs> and it's like oh fuck they're screwed it's so well done yeah it's a really but good movie Al Pacino is insane in this movie he's so good he had this amazing run in the 70s with Godfathers and this and, and Serpico it's just he, the guy's career is crazy and I don't think a lot of people have seen this film but if you haven't watched this and it's one of the, his performances where a lot of people think they all machine does the same thing all the time but like this movie he is incredible in it yeah I don't like when people say that about actors like oh they he does the same thing it's like because they're always the same they're always in, because they're in so many movies first of all so you get to know the person you get to know like what they their mannerisms are like and I mean, not everyone's Daniel Day-Lewis. They're not going to change their entire personality. But Al Pacino is probably, you could argue, one of the best actors of all time. 100%. 100%. So good. Next up, we have the great No Country for Old Men, directed by the Coen brothers. This is one of our personal favorite films, seen in a bunch of times. And we did an episode, if you guys like this movie, we did an episode of No Country for Old Men and There Will Be Blood together, like a showdown. It's a great, great episode, but they fought. Yeah. <laughs> but so well crafted. This is my favorite Coen Brothers movie. It's one of my favorite movies in general. Uh, Anton Sugar is a fascinating character, and Javier Bardem was amazing in this role. Like, he came out of nowhere in America with this movie and blew up. And then Josh Brolin, this was his breakout, even though he was like in his 40s. It took him a while to get big in the film industry in Hollywood. And after this movie, people started casting him in a ton of stuff. How could you forget Tommy Lee Jones? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Who plays the sheriff in this movie? I think and it's Tommy Lee's best performance. He's really good. Yeah. And you're right, because Josh Brolin, his father was a famous actor. James and, Brolin. Yeah, James Brolin. So you in his... He's famous from the Am- Amityville Horror. Yeah. And so you'd think like, oh, he... 
be. But he was in the Goonies. Yeah, but Josh. No, yeah, but no one knew who he was until this movie. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. In this movie, it's it's uh, adapted from the book by Cormac McCarthy, and this book is phenomenal. It's one of the best. I think it's my favorite or the best adaptation from book to movie I've ever seen. Yeah, the most it's accurate. so accurate. By far the most accurate. That, that book is set up when to you be read, a movie already. If you read, if you watch the movie and then you read the book, you're like, it feels like you're reading a screenplay of yeah, the movie. Yeah, that's what it feels like. It's yeah. like set up already for it perfectly. Yeah. And then we have The Godfather Part 1 and 2. We're putting them in the same number, number 30. Because cheating. Released in 1972 and 1974, respectively. Uh, directed by Francis Ford Coppola. And, I mean, we got to do an episode on these pretty soon because... People are asking for it. Arguably the best movies ever made. You could say that Godfather's the best movie ever made. I prefer Godfather Part 2 because I love being with uh, Vito back in Italy and watching his rise in America when he first comes to the country. So it's really fascinating uh, back and forth between those two timelines. But The Godfather... Perfect movie. Yeah, best there's, movie ever. there's not much you can say that hasn't already been said about them. They're some of the best movies ever made. And if we had to put it on the list, we were we were like, should we put mom movies in this list? We have to do mom yeah. movies because we, yeah. we'd have to cut like at least 10 of these out besides just like not just Godfather's mom movie. I mean, technically. Including the next one, my yeah. one of my favorite movies, Goodfellas. I didn't know you liked this movie. Uh, yeah, no one knows really. I haven't really talked about it. Never. And obviously made by the great Marty Scorsese. And Scorsese. This movie... It's so has so much energy. It's it, an epic, but it flies by. It's so inter- I think this is one of the most entertaining movies ever made. It, you can watch this movie countless times. If it's on, you just put it on. You're like, like I'm going to sit down for three hours and watch this movie. It just never stops. And I think Scorsese put everything into this movie. It's I think it's his. One, it could be his greatest film. It's hard to decide. He's made so many, but I just love watching this film. Yeah, based on the loosely on the true story of Henry Hill, who was. And his life in the mob and covering his relationship with his wife. Karen! 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 Where's the money? The <laughs> Pittsburgh money! <laughs> and his partners, Jimmy Conway and Tommy DeVito. And this Italian crime syndicate. kid. And it's, the characters are, are some of the best characters in film in general. Like, top of your head. You, if you list, made a list of like your 30 favorite characters, I, I guarantee Jimmy Conway and Tommy DeVito on there. Yeah, but you could also argue Henry Hill is the coolest character in movie history. Yeah. You could argue that. Whether or not it was as accurate as people say, a lot of people from the mod come out and say, like, Henry Hill wasn't that high up and he wasn't that important of a person. Yeah. But it's still a great movie. And not just the filmmaking techniques and style, but the the music to this film as well. Like, Martin Scorsese is probably the king of choosing music for films. He and, is. You know, a lot of directors are pretty good at it, too, as well. I mean, Edgar Wright's really great at it. And Tarantino, obviously. So, but but Scorsese... He didn't start it, but he made it his own. Perfected yeah, it. Perfected. The, the music brings so much energy to the film. And what's really cool about Henry Hill, it's a really funny story. Henry Hill was living in witness protection, and he wrote the book, and um, he was still in witness protection. And when Goodfellas came out, it was such a sensation and so popular, he began bragging to everyone he knew, all his new friends, that he was actually Henry Hill, who the movie was based upon. And he, he bragged about it so much that he, the police kicked him out of witness protection. Yeah, I mean, how arrogant can you be? You, <laughs> I'm surprised no one took him out. Yeah, for real. But I think that's probably— Everyone else is dead, I think, by this point. Maybe. That's what happens in the mob. Everyone dies. Yeah. So there's no one left to, like, Sh- want to take you out. Short life expectancy for most people in there. Yeah. Next up, we have The Departed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just Scorsese back-to-back. Scorsese back-to-back, of course. Released in 2006, directed by Marty. And this is— one of our favorite movies as well. We have Leo and Matt Damon who play... Matt Damon. Leo's an undercover cop, and then Matt's a mole in the police, state police department of Massachusetts, and they are trying to basically identify each other while Leo is infiltrating this Irish gang led by Jack Nicholson's character. One of his best performances. I think yeah. it's like his last role, right? He retired after... I believe after this he retired. I Maybe this is his last yeah, big movie. Or his last movie role. I could be wrong. Someone fact check us on that. Yeah. But um, it's The Departed, man. This movie is the ultimate cops and robbers in a modern world. And the, the the ending of this movie just knocks you back because of what Scorsese and the screenwriters do to the characters that you would never expect to happen. And it, it just shows to, goes to show you that The Departed, the, that's the theme of the movie, Departing. The Departed. The Departed. <laughs> daily, da- the Daily Departed. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have Seven, which was directed by David Fincher. Uh, with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman, this is one of my favorite police movies. I think it's, I think it's probably the best movie depicting investigation, possibly. Um, and it's got such a, an intense and memorable villain in John Doe. Uh, but it's a disturbing movie. It's very disturbing. It's hard to watch. I remember I showed this to 
uh, a girlfriend once and she was like i messed up after watching this i was like <laughs> that was a mistake <laughs> i shouldn't have done that but um i i watched i've seen this movie a bunch of times and the more you watch it the the less the graphic nature disturbs you so it becomes easier to watch and you can appreciate what david fincher did i i argue that this is probably david fincher's best movie I, i'll make that argument i i think i agree with you too because the filmmaking is just astounding i mean the cinematography of course and the acting the the directing but just like the the aesthetic that fincher created in this city which is never identified we assume it's like chicago new york or something like that some big metropolis where it's just like the theme of the film is just so dark. The city's so dark. It's rotting from the inside. It's always dark. It's always raining. Just the atmosphere of every scene is just, it just drains you of all your, it's like a dementor watching this whole movie. It's just, you're sucked of all happiness and, and emotion, but not, but Fincher plays it so well where it doesn't take away from the film. It, and it's a really, really well-written script. I'm surprised it got no recognition in terms of the screenplay. It's so well done. And Fincher's new movie is actually um, being, it was written by the writer of Seven, so I'm very much looking forward to that. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? But great, great movie. I'm sure you've all seen it. Next up, number 35, we have The Dark Knight. Maybe you heard of it. Yeah, directed by Christopher Nolan in 2008. And it's The Dark Knight. This is probably the best superhero. No, it, this is the best superhero movie that has ever been made, will ever be made. This changed the Oscars. They increased the number of Best Picture nominees in a category because of The Dark Knight not being nominated, even though it was clearly the best film that year. This changed what you could do with superhero characters where you, you can make a serious film about it. And what I think is so different about this movie, well, first of all, I love the Nolan Batman movies in Batman because... Batman, he has supernatural foes and villains and villains with certain powers and stuff and sensationalized. But what Nolan did is that he made his movie. It, there's no powers anywhere. There's no superpowers. There's no uh, unbelievable things. It's just it feels very much like the real world, and that's why it works. And especially The Dark Knight is something of its own because it's not a superhero movie. It is a crime epic. You know what I mean? It's And he was actually very much inspired by the movie Heat. And if you watch those movies back to back, you can see a lot of the similarities and a lot of the inspiration he took from that movie. And that he he he's the only one who understood, like, what if I took the tone and the filmmaking of Heat and the storyline of Heat and put it into the Batman world? And that's what was just like lightning in a bottle. Yeah, because it's different than Batman Begins because with Batman Begins, he just brought realism to the genre, realism to a superhero character. Like, what would the world really be like if Batman, if Bruce Wayne really existed and there was this like ultra super villain trying to destroy a city or something like that so that's what's great about them being back and forth uh, the sequels they're so different from each other that and batman begins yeah next up we have reservoir dogs tarantino's big breakout i'm sure all of you have seen it and it, he changed the game with with movies in, in american cinema with this film in terms of the ultra violence in terms of the the storyline being woven into different areas uh, the characters being very uh, memorable and the dialogue being very realistic to authentic dialogue that we see in the real world in terms of referencing pop culture, telling stories. Most of what how people communicate, mostly mostly we communicate through stories, whether it be a small story, a big story. And that's something that Tarantino has always implemented into his writing of people telling stories to other people. Yeah. And I know Pulp Fiction, you know, you could say is Tarantino's best movie. And had a huge impact on film and cinema, but you could argue that Reservoir Dogs had a bigger impact on film and cinema because this was tried to be replicated by so many people. You can't replicate Pulp Fiction. Like, you can't. No one can do that. No one besides Tarantino has that, like, that ability to take five different storylines and, and juxtaposing different timelines and everything like that. But Reservoir Dogs changed the game with, with crime cinema for the end of the 20th century beginning of the 21st century and it's a heist movie where we don't even see the heist it's so ironic and brilliant mm, we I just see it. the characters before and after and we have the undercover cop situation and it's it's a really genius movie yo mr pink <laughs> um before we continue why don't you tell us about uh, movieposters.com our, our great sponsor movieposters.com head on over to their website and use our promo code raiders 15 to get 15 percent off your order today if you're watching our set on YouTube, you'll see that the walls are decked out with these amazing movie posters. These are high quality stuff. Movieposters.com has every kind of backlighting, framing, sizing you want in a poster, as well as a gigantic selection of pretty much every movie imaginable. 
If you're a fan of movies, if you're a fan of TV shows, there's no better way to express that love than by decking your place out with a ton of posters. And there's no better place to do that than at movieposters.com. Again, use our promo code Raiders15 to get 15% off your order today. Yeah, we've actually been getting a lot of DMs and photos of people using our coupon code at Movie Posters and Love they've to been see it. decking up their walls. They look great, guys. Deck it out. All right, next up we have Silence of the Lambs, released in 1991, directed by Jonathan Demme. This is the best serial killer movie ever made, probably. It's it's probably better than Seven. Um, we have a terrific performances with from Jodie Foster, first of all, as this young FBI cadet who's who's trying to use... Hannibal Lecter's expertise and brilliance to try to track down a current serial killer and Anthony Hopkins as is, is Hannibal Lecter is one of the most terrifying, brilliant performances in cinema history. Yeah, Jonathan Demme made this. I think it's one of the best movies ever made. It has probably a couple of the greatest performances we've ever seen with uh, Jodie Foster and, and Anthony Hopkins. And Anthony Hopkins, ironically, was considering quitting acting and just moving back to the UK to do theater. Uh, and this was his like final shot at becoming a, a Hollywood star. And he put everything into it. And even though he has 17 minutes of screen time in this movie, he is by far the most memorable thing about the film itself. And it's so well crafted, so well written. Uh, I adore this film so much. Yeah, one of the one of the three films in history to win the big five Oscars, which are best director, best picture, best screenplay, best uh, actor, and best actress. Right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. leading leadings or, or supporting. Oh yeah, he got leading actor, right? Or no? No, I guess supporting. Oh, I think yeah, supporting. Just acting a categories. Any, yeah, yeah, the acting category category. can be either one of the four. Next up, we have Chinatown, which was written by Roman, Pol which was directed by Roman Polanski, and this is a, a famous, famous investig investigatory drama, which stars Jack Nicholson investigating uh, circumstances within L.A. And I think this is a, a perfect film. It's uh, perfectly written, and Polanski proved himself to be—he's clearly one of the best directors ever. With this film, he actually even acts in it too. He's the guy that cuts Jack's nose. That looks so realistic yeah. still every time I watch still it. Looks I, I, like, I know it's coming. I'm always like, yeah. ah, he's yeah. going to do it. Because it looks like he really did it. And uh, I think this is one of Jack Nicholson's greatest performances, even though he's been in so many amazing movies. I really love this film. Yeah, because not only is he investigating as a PI the the missing woman, and it, obviously in the beginning of the film, he's, it's actually a great introduction of him with the the. The, the I mean the affair investigation, which mm -hmm. you can see is clearly what he usually does is affairs yeah. and stuff like that. But then he gets caught up in this giant corruption scheme, and not only is there a murder involved, there's the corruption of the water being stolen from the valley of of L.A. and the northern parts of the city to the city parts. So it's kind of like shows you the real corruption that happened in Los Angeles because L.A. was. The, at one time, probably the most corrupt city in America. It probably could still be. It was, it was still kind of like the wild, wild west it in really, terms yeah. of people developing land and resources there. Because water yeah. is so important out here. It's yeah. like it's like Dune and Arrakis. <laughs> <laughs> two, two Dune references so far. Here we go. But it's, it's one of Jack's best performances, and Polanski is a master filmmaker. Next up, we have the conversation, which was written, which was directed by Francis Ford Coppola, and he, he, as they, as he said in the gentleman, um, he squeezed this puppy in between the Godfathers. <laughs> <laughs> Great reference. <laughs> and um, this is a, so, like, this is the ultimate paranoia movie in terms of. Gene Hackman plays a character who he gets paid to spy on people and, and record conversations for people who hire him. Yeah, surveillance. Yeah, surveillance. And it's great. This is a great surveillance film. This is, I think, the first time we really saw what surveillance was like back then. And the technology at the time was state of the art, but now it's pretty pretty rudimentary. But this this film is such a great play on suspense and thrills. And Gene Hackman's character is super super fascinating, very complex. But the movie is it's a slow burn thriller that ends in an amazing way. John Cazell's in this too, right? He is. Yeah, he so, plays his partner. Yeah, it's one of the, another one of those five films he starred in that was nominated for Best Picture and very, very good movie. I mean, if if you've never seen it, it's kind of like Rear Window. You know, you, you spend a lot of time with no dialogue at all. You're with Gene Hackman doing the surveillance. You're just watching him watch people basically, and it's it's really interesting because I think a lot of people are fascinated by people watching, and then to watch it play out in a large portion of a film, it's really cool. Yeah, it's one of the best opening shots of all time as well. And then we have Scarface, released in 1983, directed by Brian De Palma. We've all seen Scarface. We all know the lines. We all had the, the poster the when we were in high school. The vibe, the music, the synths, the darkness. And Al Pacino as this Cuban immigrant who comes, comes into Miami to take over the drug 
cartel there and become a, a kingpin in the, in the world of, of that city. And this movie, as tongue-in-cheek it can be, in it's super fun. There's also some great violence, great core like that. Scene in, in the hotel bathroom with the saw. Oh my god, it's so crazy. And it's it's a wild movie. Never nothing had ever been made like this because but De Palma brought this really unique tone to the, the gangster bi- biopic. This movie is a trip. Yeah. With the music, the aesthetic, the like the lighting and and just the world of that of that culture was fascinating to watch. Mm-hmm. Next up we have Point Break, directed by Catherine Bigelow. I am an FBI agent. I can never describe how I'm feeling. I can't describe what I'm feeling. We actually just watched this. It's it, it's an epic movie. It's Keanu versus Swayze. It's it's the best, and it's so much fun. Yeah, it's a little cheesy sometimes. No, it doesn't really make too much sense, but who cares? It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, Keanu's acting in this is suspect, yeah. to say the least. That's like a compliment. Not, we love him. We love Keanu to death, but, you know, he's not great in this movie. He gets the job done. Yeah, you know, he's, he's good to look at. He's, he's, he's <laughs> nice to look yeah. at. But, I mean, thank God, like, Swayze's such a great actor. Gary Busey's he really, really is great. Movie, yeah. so, so they help carry the load of, of leading this film, and it's it's point break, man. It's it's one of the best, like, undercover crime heist movies ever it's so much fun and this is actually the fast and furious basically ripped off the point break storyline oh 100 yeah. percent. It's, it's fast and furious is point break but with cars yeah yeah and then we have drive released in 2011 directed by nicholas winning reffin and the stars ryan gosling is that mysterious car stunt man driver mechanic who also runs illegal j- jobs as a driver at night during heists and winning reffin is is such a talented filmmaker he was kind of obscure for a while. I think that Drive is the one that brought him to American audiences. Obscure in America. Yeah. He was big in Denmark. Yeah, So, but he's a great European filmmaker, and his movies have a very unique aesthetic. You know, he's got a lot of the neon lights that we see a lot of his recent films today. That started with this movie. Yeah, but but this Drive is very creative. He does a lot of that super slow-mo, and the music involved is fantastic. And so this movie, it's like this this fairy tale, it feels like, at the same time as extreme ultra-violence, like... The elevator scene is intense, and Driver is such a great character because he's such a mystery to us. And still, at the end of the movie, we still don't know who this guy is. Yeah, that's great. Ultra violence is like the main theme in all of his films, and he actually discovered Mads Mikkelsen. Yeah, in the Pusher, the Pusher trilogy. trilogy. Yeah, yes, and this is I watched this movie I think three times in theaters. I loved it so much when yeah. it came out. Never seen anything like it. He actually won Best Director at Palm. We saw this at Coolidge Corner, yeah. I think, right. In Boston. And landmark. Coolidge in Corner. <laughs> in Brighton. I, I freaking love this movie. It's Brighton, great. Yeah. Next up, we have Scream, which was directed by Wes Craven. Uh, the best slasher flick, one of. It's so much fun. And what makes it different is it knows what it is. It's not trying to be serious. It's not trying to be just scary. It's also combining great humor, uh, making fun of the serial killer tropes we got used to from the movies in the 80s and 90s. And all around, it's just it's just a fun time. This movie. Yeah, I think this is the only horror film that we put on this list because it's it's unique in terms of it. It is really based just off crime at the same time. Not that like like Halloween isn't based off crime and like Last House on the Left isn't based off crime, but I think Scream sets itself apart not in just the slasher genre but in the horror genre in general. And then we have The French Connection, which was released in 1971, directed by. William Friedkin, a pair of New York City cops in the Narcotics Bureau, stumble onto a drug smuggling job with a French connection starring Gene Hackman. This was a very big move for Gene, and also William Friedkin is famous for making The Exorcist, and he made these pretty close to each other. He did The French Connection and The Exorcist. Like, what a friggin' combination of two movies to come back to, to come out back to back. And this movie uh, defined, like, what a detective drama could be like when you throw a great action into it, because it has... You could say the greatest car chase ever, where Gene Hackman's character literally chases a train through the city to try and catch the criminal who's on the train. On the train, and the way they filmed the car chase is actually they didn't get any permits for the city. They didn't ask for permission. They literally were performing in crazy, intense driving stunts in the middle of New York City, and they actually almost killed a bunch of innocent bystanders. And there was a real accident. Where they crash into a pedestrian car. Jesus. Yeah. So they, that. they broke a lot of rules when they made this car chase. I mean because, laws. Yeah, and laws because they had no money. Uh, but they got away with it. Jeez. Yeah. That's pretty wild. It's crazy. Next up, we have Training Day, directed by Anton Fuqua. And this stars the great Denzel Washington. We just talked about it and um, recently, and we also did a, a Denzel Spotlight as well. Uh, we adore this movie. He and Ethan Hawke are magnetic together. Great, great storyline, and, and I consider it one of the best performances of all time for an actor. 
it's up there. Um, I still think like his performance in Crimson Tide is like my favorite Denzel performance. It's so underrated. But Ethan Hawke's awesome in this, and we did an episode on this a couple weeks ago. So check it out if you want some more on it. But it's an, it's a great movie. It's one of our favorite crime movies. It's so fun to watch. Denzel, like you said, is a legend. He's so good in it. And I mean, Antoine Fuqua is a really really great director, and he does a lot of different genres. And Training Day is, of course, his most popular one. Yeah. Next up, we have City of God, released in 2002, directed by Fernando Morales. In the slums of Rio, two kids' paths diverge as one struggles to become a photographer and the other a kingpin. This is very heavily requested. We might have to do an episode on this soon. Yeah, this is one of the best foreign films ever made recently. And this was actually, I believe this movie was when I was discovering international films. Uh, this was one of the movies that I watched a couple of times when I was like discovering international cinema. And it really is, it, I'd never seen anything like it because I've seen crime movies, but this involves such young kids. It's kind of like the movie Gamora, the Italian film where these young boys are just living in this slum and, and there's so much danger in the streets of this area. It's hard for, any, for anyone to get by. And it's like, you can either be a gangster or try and get out the best you can. Yeah, really cool look and aesthetic. Cinematography is really awesome. And I like that circle shot is really cool in the middle of the street. Yeah, and it's told through the perspective of kids, which is really unique. Great, great movie. Next up, we have LA Confidential. Directed by Curtis Hansen, and this is a, a great film noir that actually came out in the 90s with uh, Russell Crowe, Kim Bassinger, and Guy Pierce. I love this movie. It's, it's one of the best L.A. movies, you know what I mean? And it has like that old Kevin school, Spacey, too. Yeah, Kevin Spacey, it, that's right. And it has that film noir. It feels like it was made 50 years before this, and uh, Russell Crowe just dominates the screen in this one. I think this is like when people were like, this guy is a star. Yeah. This movie is sexy. Yeah, that's oh, like, yeah. I think that's it the best way to say it. It's a yeah. sexy movie. It's great action, great mystery, a lot of great acting performances. And like, I think my favorite scene is when Russell Crowe breaks the chair with his bare hands yeah. because he's like this Rottweiler just being held back by his badge and everything. And then mm -hmm. once in a while, he lets that rage out because of the, his relationship with the young woman in it. And I think they captured what uh, Chinatown felt like. Yeah. You know what I mean? I agree. For sure. This is what like that that movie with Josh Hartnett and Howard Harrison Ford, the Hollywood homicide. homicide? Yeah, I think that's what they wanted this to be. <laughs> or oh they wanted God. it to be the LA Confidential. Probably Harrison Ford's worst movie. Next up, we have Animal Kingdom, released in 2010, directed by David Michaud. Michaud, Michaud, I don't I think I'm saying it wrong. This is a great, great movie. It's, it's an Australian film, and we have Ben Mendelsohn, Joel Egerton, and what's what's her name, the, the mother of the family? She's in um uh she's in Silver Linings Playbook. Yeah, I can't remember her name off the top of my head. But this is an amazing movie about this family that's involved with crime and we Jackie Weaver. Yeah, Jackie Weaver. We're, we're following the the teenager, he's like 17, 16 years old, trying to survive in this crime family and the detect there's a detective who thinks he can save them and pull him out of this family, but he's being Guy corrupted. Pierce, yeah. yeah, he's being corrupted by what his his older brothers do. And Joel Edgerton he was he became big after this, but Ben Mendelsohn in this movie is unbelievable. He plays a ruthless killer, but he's, he has so much charm and charisma. I think it's such a complex performance. And after this movie, I saw this movie and I was like, who's that guy? That guy is crazy. I've never seen him in anything before. And he blew up after this. Yeah, and the, the characters are great because Joel's character is trying to like – be a father figure in a way to this young kid like even like that bathroom scene where he's like you're not gonna wash your hands after taking a piss like stuff like that you'll see and he's like he's trying to be a good guy as well as being a criminal but ben mendelson is like a completely corrupted person and just like the the sinister evil character that throws the wrench into everything and yeah. ruins everything yeah everyone you gotta watch this movie it's excellent next up we have hell or hell or high water directed by david mckenzie and this is about a pair of brothers who c commit a series of bank robberies to help pay for their mom's home and her hospital bills. And it stars uh, Chris Pine and Ben Foster, as well as Jeff Bridges. And it's an excellent, excellent movie. It's uh, a heist movie we've seen a thousand times, but Mackenzie wrote it in a very nuanced way where you really uh, were behind the, the characters and were rooting for them in a way. And also Jeff Bridges brings a lot of comedy to the film as well. Yeah, it's a great modern Western. And, I mean, Chris Pine, I mean, he's great in Star Trek, but, like, this is the movie I watched. I'm like, Chris Pine's a, yeah. Pine's a great actor. Good, good actor, yeah. Because, I mean, he brings in this movie big time, and he's, like, the leader of this, this great mustache. these brothers. Yeah, excellent mustache and Five O'Clock Shadow. But it's, it's such a fun ride because it's like Bonnie and Clyde kind of, but, yeah. like, modern day. Exactly. And then our final film is going to be Die Hard. Released, Why not? 
All right, let's Why do it. Why the hell not? <laughs> Released in 1988, this movie stars Bruce Willis and Alan Rickman. It's the great heist of the Nakatomi Tower. Yeah, this movie just defined action in the in the late 80s, and uh, everyone tried to copy it. But this is just like, like Dark Knight, like lightning in a bottle. It, it shouldn't work, but it does. And it works because of Bruce Willis more than anything. He, he showed how much star power he had. He wasn't a movie star before this. And what makes this movie great is that uh, John McClane, he's like an everyman. He doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Sylvester Stallone. He just looks like a normal guy. And that's why I think everyone loves him so much because he's just like a wise-ass who's just like super sarcastic and kind of having fun while he's killing all these bad guys. Yeah, and you know, it's got the buddy cop element with the other cop that he's talking with on the radios. I mean, we've, we've seen this movie a dozen times, each of us listening. I'm sure we all a know all, dozen. all the great lines. This is probably our favorite Christmas movie directed by John McTiernan, who also did The Predator. I mean, yeah, Predator, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he did Predator. So he did it. We love Die Hard. It's great. And that... That wraps our best crime movies of all time episode, everybody. That was epic. Really hope you enjoyed well, this. Well, hold on. We got to do the finale. What is? What do you think is the best crime movie Oh, the finale. Time? Best crime movie? I'm going to say Goodfellas. Great pick. I think Goodfellas is just it. For me, it's Heat. Because mm-hmm. when I think of- Yeah, a... we know. You say it every episode. <laughs> <laughs> when I think of Heat, I'm like, cop- it's like cops and robbers. And also, you get to see not just the criminals, but also- the good guys, you know, the cops investigating. And so I think because they brought both storylines together and then the action, and I, I love great action. And it, Michael Mann just tied it together and it's a, a friggin' incredible movie. So great. So I think that Heat is the ultimate crime movie. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Be sure to go to patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast. Become a patron today. Get access to those bonus episodes and everything and all of our content there. Go to RaidersOfLostPodcast.com. Check out all of our sources of content. Subscribe, follow, hit the notification bell wherever you're watching, listening. Leaving those five-star reviews is super helpful. Thank you so much wherever you're listening and watching around the world. Take care, everyone. Raiders of the Lost Podcast is a Mirror Image production. Sound mixing done by Jacob Kosler. Opening music by Chase Jackson. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost podcast. Hit that subscribe button and notification bell. Listen to the audio formats of Raiders of the Lost podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes every Monday and Thursday. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost podcast.